This morning's chapel is our Dean's Chapel, so we will hear a message from God's Word by Dr. David Powell, the Dean of TEDS. Our uh, pastoral prayer this morning is from our Provost, Dr. Wayne Johnson. Uh, Dr. Felipe Dovale um, will be uh, reading scripture, and I'm pleased to be working with my friends and uh, a couple familiar to many of you, Steve and Amy McCausland, very involved around TEDS and across campus, and uh, musical leaders and worship leaders as well. Now we enter this hour of worship justified by faith, given access through grace, rejoicing in hope. For if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Let us rejoice in God through our Lord, uh, reconciling Lord Jesus Christ. Will you stand with us as we sing together? Tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves, 
where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone your presence Lord oh, Holy Spirit you are welcome here come flood this place and fill the atmosphere your glory God is what our hearts long for to be overcome by your presence Lord there's nothing worth more they will ever come close no thing can compare you're our living home your presence i'll taste it and seen of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone in your presence Lord. oh holy spirit you are welcome here come flood this place and fill the atmosphere your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here, come flood this place and fill the atmosphere, your glory. Let us join together in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that you are not a God who is simply far away, but you are a God who is with us, who indwells within us through your Holy Spirit. We thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us and rose again and is coming again. And we thank you for the Spirit who indwells us, guides us, and transforms us into your image. Lord, we're so grateful for the opportunity to be here together in your name, to worship together. We thank you for each staff member, faculty member, and student as we begin this new semester. We pray that you might bless it. Lord, we pray that you might use us all together to accomplish your purposes in our lives this semester, that we might bring glory to you. Lord, we are deeply aware and touched by the fact that this world is not yet the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. We are aware of the suffering that is going on in the world in different places. We think of Afghanistan, we think of Haiti, we think even of those who are suffering this morning because of the uh, consequences of the hurricane. And countless other things, Lord, that could um, uh, discourage us and, and indeed call us to prayer. We pray that you would be at work even in the midst of these difficult circumstances, that you would bring remedy and uh, relief of suffering to those who are persecuted, to those who are hungry, to those who are suffering in different ways. But Lord, we also realize that in the midst of this, we are called to cry out, come Lord Jesus. We think of those who are perhaps sick with COVID or who are simply racked with fear because of this. 
And Lord, we are reminded of your faithfulness and your goodness and your grace to us and that our lives, our very lives are in your hands. And what better place is that to be? Thank you, Father, for the sure promises of your word that Jesus Christ will come again to set all things right. And in the meantime, that you have called us to be part of your mission in the world, to bear witness to the power of his resurrection, to bear witness to the sufficiency of his cross and his sacrifice for us, to reconcile mankind to you and to reconcile us to one another in Christ. Father, even in the midst of many things which are discouraging, may you enliven us and encourage us to be those who are on a mission for you, whether it be with our classmates, our faculty, our students, our neighbors, our roommates, or those even across the world, that we might be instruments of good and instruments of your grace and your mercy in whatever way you see fit. Use this semester for good, we pray. Strengthen us, encourage us, and help us to encourage and strengthen one another. But we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. A reading from Acts 9, 1 through 18. Please stand for the reading of God's word. Acts 9, 1 through 18. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind, and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias! Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. The Lord, Ananias answered, I've heard many reports about this man and the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how, he must, how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me to, so that you you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Good morning. Thanks for the uh, prayer and the singing, and I also want to thank um, Dr. Dovell. This is his first day of classes at TEDS, and he's willing to serve with us this morning as well. And also um, Professor Charles King, um, leading his first chapel here at TEDS as well. And I heard that he prefers to be called King Charles. So <laughs> this morning we are reading from Acts 9. If you have the Bible with you, turn back to Acts 9. 
I remember exactly 40 years ago, when I was still in junior high, um, I received a call to full-time ministry. And that was 40 years ago in August. And later on, I realized that, um, you know, every one of us, we are being called to full-time ministry. You can be serving in a church. You can serve, be serving in a workplace. You can be serving at home. But we, we are serving God. I realized also that calling is not simply one form of calling. We are not simply being called in the vision. You can be called by evaluating your past, your experiences, how you can be best used by God. You can be called by having a voice in your head, serve him. You can be called by your parents urging you to serve him. You can be called by being devoted to God and being felt and being participating, being able to participate here at Tets, figuring out how best to serve him. But then it, it was an interesting and um, important experience for me 40 years ago when I was being called. I remember um, in a huge revival hall, um, sitting in a balcony, walking down um, then to, to the front of the stage, responding to the call, not realizing what happened, not knowing what is to come, quite confused at night, um, figuring out what went on, you know, what, what, what is the call, what am I supposed to be doing? This morning we'll be reading from Acts 9, the call and conversion of Paul. It'll be interesting to see how Luke had decided to write this particular account. If I were to ask you to put out a piece of paper and rewrite the account from memory, how would your account be different from Luke's account? How would you introduce Paul? How would you describe how he was being called? How is your account different from the inspired account, allowing us to know exactly what it meant to be called by God? So this morning, the little time that we have, I want to ask three questions. First, how was Paul or Saul being introduced? And second, who exactly was being called? And third, what exactly is the content of the call? The first one is easier if you have memorized X. <laughs> How exactly was Paul introduced? If I were the one writing X, I would probably say that you know, Paul or Saul, he had a pretty good CV, a good education under Gamaliel, a good religious background, Pharisees, um, a good political background as well, Roman citizen, a good Greco-Roman education perhaps, growing up in Tarsus, uh, one who is devoted to his service, being willing to serve um, the temple and the Pharisees, uh, pursuing the church. So if I were the one writing, I would list a bunch of education, experience, qualifications, awards, publications, and all that as a good CV for Paul. But imagining the first readers of Luke and Acts not knowing anything about Paul was well, quite unlikely. But still, knowing a bit about Paul, but then first hear the name Saul or Paul. How was Paul being introduced? Let's turn back to chapter 7, 58. First time we encountered Paul is in chapter 7 of Acts, well, first time in Luke and Acts, that is, um, Acts seven fifty-eight. We don't know who he is. We don't know how old he was. We don't know his background. We don't know nothing about Paul. But 758, when Stephen was being stoned, you find people, the persecutors, um, putting the clothes on a person by the name of Saul. So a young man named Saul, that's all we heard. Again, we don't know much about Saul, except for the fact that he was the one persecuting the church, the enemy of the word. Chapter 8, verse 1, again you find the same repeated emphasis on Paul or Saul being perse the persecutor 
of the church. So Saul was there giving approval to his death. Again, we don't know anything about Paul at this point. Verse 3 of the same chapter. But Saul began to destroy the church consistent with 758 and 8.1 that Paul was the enemy of God. And chapter 9, the next reference, 1 to 2. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the church. So when we come to chapter 9, we don't know anything about Paul except that he was not a good person. He was the enemy. He's, he was the one persecuting the church. That would, would not be the way I would introduce Saul, a Paul, the most important apostle, perhaps, in this particular work. He would dominate chapters well, 13 to 28. Is that the way to introduce a person? Now, if um, Pastor Chuck King is to introduce me this morning, saying David is really not a good person, GPA of 2.0, and um, didn't know much about anything, no experience at all, except that he was not a good person. You don't introduce a person that way. But this is how Luke is introducing Paul. Nothing about him being a Pharisee, nothing about him being a pious Jew, nothing about him knowing the Torah, nothing about him being a Roman citizen, nothing about him having rhetorical skills, nothing about him that is anything remotely good except that Paul is the enemy of God. So in this particular account then, Paul was called not because he was good, but in spite of the fact that he was not. God was merciful to him. God is able to use him, not because he had a good training, but in spite of the fact that he was not exactly good. He doesn't have a good past. He doesn't have a good CV in the eyes of God. But God is still able to use him. Reading from Acts 1 to 9, perhaps we have encountered several characters of similar traits already. Judas in Acts 1. Perhaps um, Simon Magus in Acts 8. Later on, you will find Herod in Acts 12. You find a bunch of enemies of the word. Paul was counted among them. But by the grace of God, in spite of the fact that he was not good, God was able to use him. So why exactly are we here serving God? Or why are we studying to prepare to serve him, perhaps? Not because you're qualified. Not perhaps because you have a good past. Not because God cannot use anyone else but you. But perhaps God is merciful to us. Paul was portrayed exactly like a Judas in Acts 9. But then, unlike Judas, he was being called. Many of you, many of you um, maybe from the Chicago area, uh, serving in local churches, once you receive your MDiv um, preaching in a church, it's never fun to preach in a church that you grew up in. People knew your past. Whatever you say, they will say, well, I, I have example one, that you can't do that. You were not able to do that. Why are you preaching A and B and C? Having people knowing your past is not, not always a good thing. I remember years ago, perhaps 15 years ago at TEDS, in the formation group, a student came up to me after the group saying that, you know, my mom was a preschool teacher. And we had a picture of you at the age of three at home. It's not good to have people knowing your past <laughs> and to say that, you know, you're the teacher, professor, pastor. How are we able to serve God? I have another student alum, in this case, from TEDS, years after graduating, coming to my office, telling me that he was not going to go into ministry because he was not good enough. Not, not that he was a murderer, not that he committed any crime, but because he was thoroughly convinced that I, I was not good enough, 
I will not be able to serve him. I don't have a good model, CV, in the eyes of God. Well, that's exactly how Luke is not introducing Saul. He did not give us a good CV of Saul. But he simply said, you know, this is the enemy of the word. And, and there you have Paul himself in 1 Timothy, saying that when I was being called, I was the worst of all sinners. He, he didn't say that, well, I had a really good education. I know Greek and Hebrew. No, I, God is merciful to me. I am able to serve him because he is good and not because I'm good. So answering the first question, how was Luke being introduced? Not in ways that we would imagine. Not in ways that I would have introduced Paul. Second question. Who is the one being called in Acts chapter 9? If you know anything about the Bible... Reading from Genesis, Exodus, we encounter a series of call accounts. People being called. Moses being called the, the burning bush. And then you have what Samuel being called. And prophets, Isaiah being called. Jeremiah being called. In that series of call accounts, you have um, a pretty consistent core formula emerging. Not always uh, would you find every single element in that formula, but often you will find um, uh, some sort of a formula when a prophet was being called. First, in a vision, God called out the name Samuel, say. And then uh, one would respond, I say, it was there, here I am. And then you find God um, providing the content of the call. Go out and lead my people out of Egypt. And then you will find, what is interesting is that you will find an objection. No way, not me. So Moses saying, no, I'm not eloquent. Uh, Isaiah saying, I'm not you know, living in, uh, among those with clean lips. Uh, I'm not able to, I'm not clean, I'm not qualified to serve. And then you find um, God reaffirming the prophet the reassurance, and, and then you find obedience. The prophet being obedient to God and, and being called and, and go out and, and preach the word. So there you have um, the formula um, from the vision, God appearing, um, you know, evoking the name or um, calling the person by name, and uh, person responding by saying, here I am, and then you find um, the content of the call, and you find um, objection, um, and then you find reassurance, and then you find obedience. You find the exact set of formula here in Acts 9. Perhaps the most complete example, or the best example of a, call, of a good call formula. You find that in Acts 9. But what is surprising is that the formula was not applied to Saul. The formula was applied to someone by the name of Ananias. Not the same Ananias, of course, of Acts 5, as a different person. And this Ananias would not reappear in Acts. So why spend half a chapter on a person who doesn't seem to be important? He will not reappear in Acts. And the focus, we know, is on Paul and not on Ananias. And God was quite capable of directly calling Saul to serve him. So why go through Ananias? Let's turn to chapter 9 again. So Acts 9 verse 10. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called him in the vision, Ananias. 
That was the first element, calling the person by name. Verse 11. Yes, Lord, he answered. So the response, here I am. And then the content of the call, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street. So that's the content of the call. And then objection in verse 13, Lord, no way, I'm not going to go there. I'll be killed by Saul. Verse 15, but the Lord said to Ananias, go, this is my chosen instrument. Verse 17, and then Ananias went to the house and entered it. So here you find the best, most complete example of a call formula in the biblical material. It was applied to someone by the name of Ananias that we don't know much about. We don't know anything about him, almost at all. So why spend half a chapter on someone who doesn't seem to be important? Why not focus on Saul? So who was the one being called? In Acts 9, was it, was it Saul or, or was it Ananias? <clears throat> if we look at the call formula, then it seems clear that it was Ananias who, who was the one being called and not Saul. So what exactly is the point? Why focus on Ananias? If you have been reading from Acts 1, you may be able to see a pattern of how God is working in history. God doesn't need, a, need our help. He doesn't need to find a good, qualified person by the name of Saul to serve him. God is quite capable of doing mighty works on his own. Acts 2, the Pentecost. Uh, there is no need for a human medium. God is able to show that he is a mighty God. We can go, go on and on. But you also see a pattern of Judas, Simon Magus, Saul, and others who are ca quite capable of trying to be an obstacle of the work of God. So on the one hand, you don't find anyone who is able to contribute to the work of God, but you find many who are trying to be obstacles to the work of God. And Acts 9, I believe, is dealing with that particular point. Ananias is saying, no, God, you cannot use Paul. He was not a good person. He was the enemy of the word. He was not qualified. I wouldn't even go to his house. Why are you going to use him? He is simply not the kind of person that can serve you. The entire chapter then would focus on Ananias by saying, yeah, God is able to be a mighty God, able to perform mighty acts in history. But all that is required of you is not to be an obstacle of his work. When Saul, when Saul or Paul saw the light, he fell right away. But then it took a bit more time to convince Ananias to be part of the history of how God is dealing with humanity. The focus then is not how great Saul is, as we had noted, but how we are often tempted to be obstacles of his work. All that's required of us is to be obedient to his call. Now, not that we are not supposed to be active participant in responding to his call. Often we have to be quite active. But all that's required of us is to recognize that God is the one working through us. It's not me. And my responsibility is simply to say, Lord, use me, not because I'm good, but because you're powerful. Perhaps a good commentary on Acts 9 is provided in Acts 10. 
There you have another story, but with a similar pattern. Who was being converted? Cornelius. No. It was actually Peter being converted in Acts 10. Yes, you find the first Gentile being converted in Acts 10. But then the focus was on Peter seeing three visions, convincing Peter that indeed a Gentile can participate in the people of God. When it comes time for Cornelius to be converted, right away he was converted. That was not a big deal. But then to convince Peter not to be an obstacle of the mighty acts of God, that was a big deal. It took him to God three visions to do it. I find it interesting how chapter 11 will summarize what happened in chapter 10. So if you turn to chapter 11, one verse, chapter 11, verse 15, um, there you find Peter repeating what happened to the conversion of Cornelius. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on him or on them. What's the big deal there? Meaning that the conversion happened before the actual sermon. It's not because Peter was able to convince Cornelius to be, to be saved, but before he was able to speak, the Spirit is already the one working. So the focus is not how, how Cornelius was converted. God is able to do that. The, the focus is on Peter not being an obstacle to the work of God. All that is required of us is not to be an obstacle of his work. But then you would say, well, that's easy. Why am I studying Greek then? Why, why am I staying all night studying Hebrew? I can just be a little passive, you know, not an obstacle to God. I remember knowing um, a theologian from the global south multi-talented uh, individual. He was, he was in politics first, years ago, but being called and left politics and converted and decided to come to the States to study. And in college, he was um, hoping or planning to be a medical doctor, a missionary perhaps. And um, in, a, in his junior year, he was, um, being called to be a full-time pastor. So gave up his pre-med, um, decided to study Greek and philosophy and all that. Went on to get his MDiv, THM. Years ago, at that point, he was accepted at Harvard for his doctoral program. He decided not to go there. He decided to go to um, another school, an evangelical school, uh, because he was called to serve in that context. After graduating, he uh, went back to his own country, being a mighty, powerful preacher, administrator, theologian, and, and all that. The president of a school, um, head of organizations, uh, being known for his many gifts and talents and publications and all that. I remember that, you know, he, um, knowing him well, um, he would not talk about himself almost at all. Not his past, not his um, accomplishments. So when he was about to retire, there was a little party for him. And he shared as to um, the key to his life, the key to his ministry. And he used a word that surprised me a bit. He said, throughout my career as a pastor, theologian, and all that, there's only one word I can use in describing what I did. And the word is being passive. To many of us, he was nothing like any passive human being. He, he was dedicated, committed, serving God in numerous ways, and following his call, working hard as well. But by being passive, he's saying, it is God working through me and not myself. And all that is required of me is not to be an obstacle of his work. And at one point, he also taught at Trinity. 
a good scholar, pastor, but one committed to being passive. Not by being lazy, and not by not working hard, but willing to follow the call and not be an obstacle to the call of God. So as we begin a new year, we ask, what is the call God has for us? And how are we supposed to be submitting to this call? Not to be an obstacle, but to be a witness to the mighty acts of God through our study, through our ministry, through our family, and all that we are. The focus is not on Saul. The focus is on Ananias, the one being called. Not to be an obstacle to the mighty acts of God. The final point that we have, the content of the call of Ananias. Going back to uh, chapter 9. Verse uh, 16. What is interesting here is that there seems to be a discrepancy of what Ananias was supposed to be saying to Saul and what he ended up saying to Saul. So in verse 16, I will show you, or I will show him, how much he must suffer for my name. So Jesus calling Ananias to talk to Saul, telling Saul how much he must suffer on behalf of his name. But look at how Ananias is conveying the message. In verse 17, Instead of telling Paul, you know, good luck, you'll be suffering, he decided to say, well, the final part of verse 17, you'll be filled with the Spirit. A much more pleasant message. So was Ananias not being faithful to his call? Was he saying, you know, let's be positive. Let's not talk about suffering. If you have a choice, being filled with the Spirit or, or suffering on his behalf, I'll probably choose to be filled, right? Power over suffering. So what exactly is going on here was Ananias not being faithful to his call. Well, first we need to know that in biblical material, often when a speech was being repeated, part of the material in part A would be missing. It would be supplied by part B so that you, have, you don't have to repeat uh, the same material. So, so we should read 16 and 17 together as an entire speech. But still, why focus on suffering in one verse and spirit in verse 17? Uh, was Jesus trying to tell Saul that, you know, you have been not my enemy, so it's now, it's now time for you to suffer. Have fun and good luck. But who exactly was a person being filled but suffer at the same time? Well, perhaps reading verse 16 again, the key word may not be suffering. In verse 16, um, the key word then is the word that came before suffering. So 16, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings, before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer. Is it possible that the key word is must, for those of you who know Greek, dei, is an important verb, a small three-letter word, but it's one being used by Luke again and again. Must suffer. Why is there a necessity for Saul to suffer? We remember from the first part of the Lucan writings in Luke 9.22, when Jesus said, the Son of Man must suffer. Must suffer. In chapter 17, again, must suffer and be rejected. In chapter 24, again, you find, Son of Man must suffer must 
pointing to the salvation plan of God. It is a divine necessity that Jesus is participating in. Jesus is saying that I am obedient to his call. I must suffer. I must participate in the unfolding of salvation, salvation history. Here that we find Saul being called, as Jesus was, being filled with the Spirit, but also he must suffer. Not as a punishment for Saul, but as an invitation for him to participate in the unfolding of salvation history. Participating in the divine necessity, having the dignity to participate in the act of God in humanity. Yes, being filled, but also being rejected, as Jesus was in the first half of the Lucan writings. This is exactly what we are called to do. Not to get a good degree, a good GPA, but to be rejected by some, perhaps, but being filled and participating in the unfolding of salvation history. Are we willing to accept this call to have the dignity to participate? This fall, we are going to talk about technology. Remember, uh, about 10 years ago, a philosopher from Cambridge, um, Stephen Cave, wrote a book on immortality, saying that um, technology and civilization is basically a, a quest to control and to alleviate suffering, a quest for immortality. So, how is that compatible with our call to suffer, our call to bear the cross? A difficult question, but I'm glad that there will be so many speakers answering that question in the, in the fourth semester. So uh, wait and pray for us as we struggle trying to be in control, trying to use our technology in some ways, but yielding to the work of God. Going back to the point of Ananias and Saul, the dignity that we have, everyone sitting here invited to be participants in, in the unfolding history of God working among his own people. Are we willing not to be an obstacle to his will? Let's pray. Lord, we give thanks to you as we worship you this morning. Allow us to participate in your work and allow us to resist the temptation to be an obstacle to your work as well. We give thanks to you because not, not because we are good, not because we are able, but because you called us the worst of all sinners. You know our past, but you are in control of our future as well. Allow us to be used by you and to be faithful to your call. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand with us one more time as we sing the goodness of God. Oh! 
have led me through the fire in darkest night you are close like no other i've known you as a father i've known you as a friend and i have lived in the goodness of god all my life you have been faithful all my Now let us hear and take with us this good word from God. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. Go in Christ to love and serve him. <laughs> 